Imagine that you are suddenly put in the situation of trying to talk someone out of committing suicide. Now imagine that this person told you that the only way they'd step off the ledge is if you can philosophically demonstrate that universally no one should commit suicide. I know, it's overwhelming and it's the biggest dilemma that philosophy can't yet fully answer because suicide is the failure of philosophy. This crack in philosophy attracted ambitious writers and philosophers who were keen on fixing or understanding it. This includes famous figures like Nobel Prize winning Albert Camus and existential philosopher Jean-Paul Sartre. However, one Viking philosopher who, despite his ideas being equivalent to our frontline defense in the face of suicide, to this day remains relatively unknown in all of mainstream philosophy. Peter Vessel the father of anti-natalism, answered the question of suicide with one word, nothing. In Zapfe's view, if you think you've found your comfort zone in this dispassionate, absurd universe, there is nothing that should philosophically stop you from committing suicide. Because the gravest mistake had already been committed, your parents had sex and you were born. While most philosophers were arguing and philosophizing whether the glass is half full or half empty, Zapfe said, theoretically, we ought to throw away the glass altogether. It's not all shit, no? Surprisingly, Zapfe had also outlined some ideas, called remedies, which constituted of four different coping mechanisms. Stick around to see how the most pessimistic philosopher to walk this earth could teach you about living comfortably. Born in 1899, Peter Zapfe was brought up in an upper-class environment in Tramso, Norway. Zapfe's childhood was described as tough in discipline. This awoke the avid mountaineer to a strong rebellion against any form of authority. This rebellious demeanor is tangibly present in his most famous literary work, The Last Messiah, a 10-page essay in which he talks about his fatalistic philosophies. These same philosophies were the centerpiece for True Detective's first season protagonist, Rust Cole. By the way, it's a true masterpiece of TV, so please watch it. I think human consciousness was a tragic misstep in evolution. We became too self-aware. Nature created an aspect of nature separate from itself. We are creatures that should not exist by natural law. Hmm, that sounds God. In The Last Messiah, Zapfi paints the human organism as a biological paradox with a consciousness surplus. An organism that is too aware for its own good. Unlike pigs, for example, humans behave differently when confronted with the death of a sibling. While a pig might show signs of pain and grief, humans want to ascribe a meaning to the suffering. They want to transcend the real world and escape to somewhere new, where alas, they could reunite with their loved ones and get closure in their stories. And this explains why religious fictions are so attractive as a lifestyle. They give us comfort when they promise us truly utopian worlds like heaven that would define and give meaning to our experience of suffering. Because of of our vastly different cognitive abilities, we have been separated from pigs and other animals in the way we perceive pain. Zapfe writes, the beast knew fear as well in thunderstorms and on the lion's claw, but man became fearful of life itself, indeed of his very being. In the beast, suffering is self-confined. In man, it knocks holes into a fear of the world and a despair of life itself. Unlike, say, a trip to the doctor where you can invite friends to come with to crush the feelings of loneliness on your way to remedying yourself, the experience of death, this, this you do on your own. Even if your loved ones had all the will in the world to accompany you, as you slowly slip into death, you're all alone. So to avoid panic, your awareness drives you to imbue your mundane, painful experiences with transcendental meaning and value. Man has longings and spiritual demands that reality cannot fulfill. We have expectations of a just and moral universe. Man requires meaning in a meaningless world. For Zapfe, being human is analogous to the Irish elk, an animal that roamed the earth and died off 14,000 years ago. The speculated cause of its extinction? It had the largest antlers of any known deer. Historically, the explanation given for the extinction of the Irish elk was that its antlers grew too large. The animal could no longer hold up their heads and feed properly. Similar to the Irish elk, through our perfectly natural evolution, we have developed an awareness too endowed for its own right. In depressive states, the mind may be seen in the image of such an antler, in all its fantastic splendor, pinning its bearer to the ground. While Zapfe lived to the ripe age of 91 with his wife by his side, his suicidal contemplations were outspoken. Why didn't Zapfe kill himself, you might ask? 
Well, I should shut the fuck up and let him explain himself. As man stands before imminent death, he grasps its nature also, and the cosmic significance of the step to come. His creative imagination constructs new fearful prospects behind the curtain of death, and he sees that even there is no sanctuary to be found. And now he can sober up to the outline of his biological cosmic truth. He is the universe's helpless captive, kept to fall into nameless, countless possibilities. From this moment on, he is in a state of relentless panic until he meets his end. If you think Zapfe lived a life of relentless panic, well, not so much. In his writings, he mapped out four methods by which humans try to explain or solve this problem of existential angst. The first method is isolation. This is when you consciously avoid thinking about your human condition and the terrible truths that Zapfe believes this entails. One should not think, it is just confusing. The second method is anchoring. It requires that we consistently focus our attention on a value or ideal. The examples Zapfe gives include God, the church, the state, morality, the future, or any other fiction we find to be convenient at the present moment. The third and most popular of all is distraction. This prevents the mind from examining itself and becoming too aware of the tragedy of human existence. It is easy to think of how we, in modern times, incessantly distract ourselves with external stimulation. Some examples Zapfe gives include entertainment, sports, radio, and the worst evil of all, fucking TikTok. Finally, we have the fan favorite and Zapfe's method of choice, sublimation, which Zapfe calls a matter of transformation rather than repression. It involves turning the very pain of living into valuable experiences. He continues, positive impulses engage the evil and put it to their own ends, fastening onto its pictorial, dramatic, heroic, lyric, or even comic aspects. Humans are creatures that perceive the world through stories, and our coping mechanisms help us give meaning to our life story, to our narrative. We are all the protagonists of our own stories. It can be life-saving to know that you need to mentally arm yourself from hating an indifferently cold cosmos, for its consequence could be a severe depressive state. Even religion can soften the blow of the dispassionate events that occur in the universe and in our lives. In states of mourning and grief, we've all heard even the most religious people say things like, he was taken too early from us. <laughs> Why is the universe so cruel? Why God? Why did you take him from us? These statements shouldn't make sense in the religious perspective because they represent a direct rejection of God's plan and of his promise to us that we will most definitely reunite with our loved ones. This is the cosmic tragedy that Zapfe talks about. Regardless of how religious you are, the sobering feeling that you will never see your deceased loved ones again, at least in this lifetime, is the hardest pill one can swallow. Even if you try washing it down with religion, they're still gone. Whether you follow a religion or not, we all use coping mechanisms to perceive and categorize the events that happen to us. And if there's anything we can actively control in this entropic, chaotic, and unpredictable storm of a universe that we call home, it is ourselves. The way we epistemically shape our coping mechanisms can either lead us to shape our story of self-annihilation or to shape our story of self-transcendence. Maybe trying to understand why we believe what we believe, why we stand up for what we think is right, is the best hangover remedy for this drunkenly abrupt human experience. This self-understanding is a form of empathy with ourselves, an empathy that can stop us from relying on one thing, one distraction, one pillar in our lives, such that when this pillar inevitably erodes, we can avoid falling into a state that we would otherwise think of as an unnatural depression or a conscious cosmic tragedy. This act of trying to understand yourself with an eye for scrutiny is a final attempt at facing your demons, or as Zapfe noted, when our forms of repression fail and the tragic can no longer be ignored, our actions of sublimation offer a remedy, a way of turning the unignorable pain of living into creative, positive, aesthetically valuable works of art. A possible cure is to try to understand and express yourself to someone, to something. A possible cure is to know thyself. Subscribe right now. See you in the next one.